Hi, welcome everybody. Lovely to see you on our uh, COS 28. We are live on YouTube. Today. Lovely to hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, good. Well, welcome to everybody to COS 28. It's now uh, we're into our second session and I'm amazed to say that we have wonderful scholars and musicians booked up until June. Today we have a very special uh, duo, uh, Cantor Jacqueline Chernet. Jacqueline is the first ever ordained cantor in the United Kingdom and we're very thrilled to to have have her. She started something called EGIL, the European Academy of Jewish Liturgy. In fact, we opened it together, if you remember, Jackie, in the House of Commons uh, with a choir, and Sol Zim was with us there too at the time. And uh, you'll be able to tell us all the things you do in teaching and uh, encouraging, stimulating, inspiring uh, cantors. So um, Cantor Yalda Riebling works with Jacqueline and she's based in Berlin where she's the spiritual leader of her congregation. Uh, we will put on all her websites and the wonderful um, recording she's made and so today they're talking about Nusach with Kavana. How do we make tefillah mean tefillah? Why is this important? How did we come to work together on it, identifying our core purpose? How does this purpose and our work affect the Jewish future? So if I can turn it over to you, Cantor Yalda. Thank you, Geraldine, for making this possible. Thank you, Geraldine, and everybody who is here to make this amazing talk and uh, connection possible. It's the blessing in the curse we are right now. All of us are experienced with this uh, terrible pandemia, but it brings us closer together in a virtual place. Tonight begins the day of the 27th of January, the day of the liberation of Auschwitz. Uh, my mom stood in front of Mengele and he sent her to life. And uh, life meant for her that she was not liberated at the 27th of January in Auschwitz. She was liberated at the 15th of April in Bergen-Belsen. And my mom was my first teacher. And she, I grew up with Yiddish music before I was born because she always sang. And I want to share with you some of her wisdom. And the wisdom goes as such. If you give a nigen, a freilache nishome, a joyful soul, it becomes a joyful nigen. And if you give a nigen, a treuerige neshome, a, a soul of sorrow, it is a, a, a nigen of sorrow. So it depends on us how we deal with it. And I have an example for you, a song she sang very often. Oh, 
Leicht, no do die alte Kasche, die 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 dum. Leicht, no do die alte Kasche, die 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 dum. Aber frei die Welt an alte Kasche, drei, di, 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 dam. Freig die Welt an alte Kasche, drei, di, 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 dam. Entfett Männer, drei, di, 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 dam. Ai, 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 drei, di, 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 dam. Und als man will, kann man euch jetzt sagen, Midrash Rabah is telling us a story. When the Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to create a world, he decided to create the world on chesed, on love. But then he looked a little more carefully into the future and saw the generation of Sedom and Edom and all the wicked what will become in this world. So he decided, I will create a word on Vura. But wait a minute. There were all the Tzadikim. There was Abraham, uh, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and there was Sarah, Rivka, Leah, and Rachel. So what to do? No. The Kadosh Baruch Hu took a very wise decision. He took the Midah, of Chesed and the Midah of Gvura. And on this balance, the world was created. Jackie, we want to talk today a little bit about Keva and Kavana of the Nusach. So from this story and from the teaching of my mom, we learned it is all about balancing. But first of all, I have a question for you. Why did you become a chazan, a female voice in a very male world? And I want to say, Jackie created a shul called Kol Nefesh, and it is an entirely Leylet shul. And Jackie was constantly teaching people, some of them taking little shtickelech, some are reading a little bit of Torah and then a bigger bit of Torah. So encouraging your kamhal, your community, just to do it by themselves. Oh, Yalda. <laughs> Fred developed the Alta Kasha. So, uh, what can I say to you? You and I are like two peas in a pod because we were becoming chazanim. I'm not going to say chazaniot because a chazan is a generic term. Uh, at the same time, without even knowing each other. And we, we have been working now together for many, many years. And what a blessing this is. I, I cannot tell you what a unique blessing uh, that both of us uh, have become chazanim. Uh, I'm a lot older than you are. And uh, please God, you have many. Yes, you <laughs> And, uh, you know, you have, please God, many years to take on because you are going to take uh, the mantle, as it were, of the, uh, the studies of Egypt. So you're asking me the question. Why did I become a Chazan? First of all, it, it, at a very late stage in my life, there was no choice. It wasn't a choice. It wasn't an if, it was a when. Um, I grew up in an Orthodox shul 
And as a girl sitting behind it, we didn't have a mechitza in those days. There was like a little rope. But the women, the girls were behind the rope. And I loved it. I loved it. All the kids ran away from Haida. I used to run because I lived in it. I loved it. And uh, so what, uh, what did it for me? Was it the learning? Yes. But overriding the whole thing was, I think, the sound. It was the atmosphere. It was the, the environment of, of the closeness of this little shawl. Uh, and and it, it just, I drank it in. It, it was by osmosis. So uh, one thing that uh, happened uh, was uh, for a couple of years running, I was a very, I was a kid, I was 16 or 15 or 16, and I would sit with my mum in the ladies gallery. We had a new shawl by then. And because the community had grown, we had, um, uh, uh, we had to split the services. I say we, I mean the people who organized it all. And, uh, and they brought in a cousin Shaney for two years running, a young bocha from Jews College. And uh, his name was Martin Cooper. And he came and he, he led the services. Well, we had a very good cousin in the shul, I have to tell you. But in this overflow service was this young man who the congregation didn't know. I actually didn't know me. I didn't know him. Why would he? And uh, he stood there. And I'll, I still have the sound of his 21-year-old voice in my ears, even if at my age, and I'm nearly 80. So this is what happens, he's, in, he's there. And the sound was so pure. His voice was not a trained voice, but it was, he, he, he davened with such sincerity. It was simple, but it was very, very sincere. And I caught this and the sound in my ear is still there. Minkomo. Who ye fen barahamin. And that simple nusach, it stayed with me forever. And then, of course, one starts living one's life and I left and I got married and all the rest and many years and three kids and a lovely husband who's hopefully watching this. Uh, and, uh, and I started to get very involved in the community itself because um, uh, we needed something in those days in the 1950s, middle of the road orthodoxy was becoming very, very oppressive. Women certainly had no place in it. Uh, there was no question about that. And so I, I'll cut the long story short. We founded the Masority movement here, which was, I guess it's, it, it was, it's a very British expression of the conservative movement in America, but more right wing, I, I, I think, than that. It's, I, I don't like labeling things. It's too complex, the whole thing. But uh, uh, I, I was uh, very heavily involved in founding uh, the first um, uh, conservative shawl, if you like. And then after some years. Away, all away. Yeah, I don't know what that was, but still. Uh, so um, uh, some years later, there was a split in the shul because some people wanted women taking part in services and like this and that. In the end, we split and we formed our Kol Nefesh. Now, Yalda, you said it was a lay-led shul, Kol Nefesh, which it is, but it's not. Because we have the most wonderful rabbi, my beloved rabbi, Joel Levy. Now, I, I, I'm mentioning Joel uh, because there are many congregations and there is a horrible historic thing about Chazanim and rabbis not getting on together and the Chazan has a terrible time and the Chazan is always the second uh, 
you know, like a, you know, considered a second class citizen and all. I'm used to being a second class citizen because I'm a woman. But the cousin and the rabbi, my rabbi and I have the most blessed relationship. And please, God, all Chazanim should have a relationship like that. Because together, it's together, and with our beautiful Kila, we, we create this beautiful sound. Anyway, so why did I become a Chazan? I'd been teaching men for years. I took it very seriously when I started uh, way back in the 19... Um, uh, 70s or 60s or something to learn to lay and I could I you know I wanted to do it and I have a wonderful uh, uncle who taught me and uh, and that was it and in the end um, I I did a, a master's degree and I can see my wonderful teacher Alexander Knapp here mm -hmm. and next to him on my screen I see my wonderful teacher Hazen Sol Zim Mwah. And I see also, I know that, that I've got other teachers here. I can see, I can see cousin Steve Robbins to you too. And there are probably others that I can't see. So forgive me. Anyway, I did this uh, degree um, uh, in the, and I had to research, of course. The, uh, I wanted to know why in England we um, use the uh, Western European trop for reading Torah uh, and why do we daven with an Eastern European Musach? It was crazy. It was a, a paradox. It didn't make sense. And so I did research into that with, my, with Alex's help. And, uh, and, and I knew at that point that Musach was, it was something that I had to get my hands in. I had to dig in the mud and see what, what's all this about? I don't get it. And at that stage, I was still unable as a woman to do anything about it in short. But I was teaching men. Go figure. So um, what happened was once we started Kol Nefesh, I thought, you know what? There are men leading these services. None of them are professionals. They, they didn't know what to do. They, they'd heard it. Of course, it's an oral tradition anyway. But they'd heard uh, and, and they were leading services with often very little meaning to it. You know, I didn't even know if they knew what they were singing about. So I thought to myself, hmm. I've got to start uh, teaching properly. And in order to teach properly, I have to be qualified because people point the finger and they say, what does she know? She's only a woman. So at that stage, I knew uh, that I had to be a husband. Now, there wasn't, you know, if I were going to start a facility to train people seriously, then I had to be, I had to get that ordination for myself. There was no question about it. So uh, I had approached the Jewish Theological Seminary and uh, they couldn't cope with me uh, because they just couldn't cope with me. I said, look, I've been studying in England for 10 years. Actually, it was wonderful. Those studies were wonderful uh, with my beloved teacher, Hazen Robbins. And... Uh, uh, but I needed, uh, I needed the ordination. Anyway, um, in the end, I, I found the Academy for Jewish Religion in New York, which was unreal. It was, I couldn't believe it. It's a pluralist academy. It, it doesn't belong to any movement. It's a blessing. It just, it's with pluralist, the teachers and the student faculty come from right across the religious spectrum and academics and everybody all together. So it gave me this incredible insight into the possibilities, the art of possibility. And there I met my beloved teacher, Hazen Solzin. And this uh, teaching was second to none. It wasn't, you see, it wasn't only the, the intricacies of the Nusach HaTfila. But it was the world of human experience by looking at a pluralist expression. 
you know, it doesn't matter whether it's orthodox. It doesn't matter whether it's reform or renewal or reconstructionist or whatever you or nothing. You know what I mean? It's Jewish. And here we learn to love. We learn to love. And so this had a huge impact on, mm -hmm. on, on the um, on the way that I wanted Egil to be. So, um, so I finished in 2006 and straight away formed uh, the European Academy for Jewish Liturgy. The name of it, E-A-J-L, was deliberate because its, it's acronym uh, sounds like an eagle. And I took all the quotes from the Tanakh that I could find about the eagle, the eagle uh, in its, the mother eagle, how it trains its babies. And uh, I, I almost, re, you know, it's Al Kanfein Sharim on eagle's wings. And I could have said Al Kanfein Sharim on the wings of singers or on the wings of poets and so this is what we did and we started out by one-to-one um, -one mentoring with wonderful teachers I became a member of the Cantor's Assembly very very important because we needed to have access to nearly a thousand Chazanim this is our teaching pool my goodness because the teaching we do is according to the needs of the student so if we have a student, and we have from all over the world, somebody comes to us and says, look, I live in Nice in France, and uh, I want to learn Moroccan Nusach. I, I want to, we have to be able to provide those teachers. And, uh, and this is what we do. And, and Yalda, then I met you and the blessing of how we were enabled to teach at the conservative yeshiva in Jerusalem during the summer, three-week intensive summer programs, magnificent. The wonderful people who've passed through our doors there and the retreats that we do. So that's why I became a chasm. Sorry, it's a bit long-winded, isn't it? No, it's wonderful, Jackie. So tell us a little bit more about the purpose of EGIL. So what is yeah. the, really the purpose of EGIL? So we don't in the first place, don't create, uh, educate uh, chazanim or uh, uh, cantors or whatever. What is, uh, what is the purpose? The purpose of Egil is very clear. The purpose of Egil is to help small communities in particular to sustain themselves. Because what's happening, and more now than ever before, it's increasing like crazy, is that people are getting together in small groups all over the world. We see it all over the world, a lot in Europe, and that's our focus. Uh, and they want to eat together on a Friday night. They want to sing together. They want to daven, but they don't know how. And we, it's not just the Friday night thing. We've got people who are at very top level in big shuls as well. But people don't know how. They don't, they say, oh, you know, I heard this when I was young or, you know, so I heard this chazan somewhere and I want to do this. But what the purpose of our teaching is to enable the people we teach to enable their congregants to enter their own davening or to fill up. We, we need to, to bring the holistic approach into it. So, so it's, it's teaching them, yes, the Nusach, because the Nusach is a strange animal. It, 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 has, it, it has like parameters within which you work depending on which uh, tradition you are involved with. And there are many. We call it keva. <laughs> we call that the keva, exactly. The keva, well, we call nusach actually, is the keva, both in terms of its text and in terms of its music. So the textual keva is the book. The Siddur, the Machzor, that's the Keva. And, and the Keva 
is the fixed kind of chance that the traditions that have come throughout the ages, according to where you are or where you've been brought up or the shul that you're in or whatever. And, um, and that's the keva, that's the fixed stuff and the rituals and everything that's keva, that's what we have. And these things have carried us through centuries. But the kavana, the kavana, it, keva without kavana is sterile in a way. Kavana is the yearning. Kavana is the heart. It's the soul. And it's the job of the chazan to be the visionary, the chazon, if you like, to, to bring that soul and that heart and that love and that yearning into the tefillah through the keva. Does that explain it? So it is about creating kehila kadosha. Yeah. That the, the goal of Egil. And you can talk a lot about it. And But the question is, how do we enable our students really to hold uh, their communities, how different as they are. So Keva is very different because we as Jews are different. We have different traditions, but even though we are Am Echad, um, and one of the, 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 the important thesis at our Egil retreats is that it doesn't matter from which background you are coming. Come, you are coming from a reform, reconstructionist, whatever background, welcome. So people have different sidurim, but we teach people how it is possible to daven all together as mm. Jews. And then you can go to look what is your special tradition and how do you deal with the needs of your community. But Kavana is so important in our work as we learn from our little Midrash. If you only have the one, it will not work. And if you only have the other, it will also not work. So how is Kavana so important in the work we are doing? Otherwise we can send somebody to, uh, I don't know, tools like the virtual cantor or whatever mm. uh, to learn it. But why is uh, Kavana so important in our work? Do you want mm -hmm. to say a little more about that? About why Kavana is so important? Yeah. I think that the human condition is uh, something that even when people say, oh, you know, I'm not religious or, you know, I don't believe in God, that doesn't matter. Every human being, every soul has uh, a yearning, a need. We pray without even thinking about it. We say words like, oh, God, you know, things like that. Well, you know, they're throwaway words, maybe. But inside a person is not just a brain and a mind. Inside a person is a soul. And human yearning at all times is, is with us. You know, we can have moments of, of a huge joy and moments of terrible anxiety and God forbid despair, and we know, we all know this. We're going through a horrible time at the moment with this COVID thing. And the, the kavana itself is a word that means intention, but it's an intention with intensity. It's, we talk about kiven libo, you know, it's, you learn you, the intensity of the heart and you're attentive with the soul and it's, you know, to, to make a, a whole person is not just a mind. We've come through the Enlightenment and uh, we learned and the whole scientific approach to everything, you know, Wissenschaft, wonderful. And it opened up a whole world to it, particularly to the Jews, as where, uh, you know, we became uh, able 
to uh, to engage in scientific research and and uh, uh, and everything. But we we're whole. We have to be a whole person, shalem, you know. So uh, this whole wholeness is is our approach. Is the approach of Ejol to bring the human condition into our tefillah in such a way that it really, it means something to everybody, to each person as they're davening. Very difficult job for the chazan. Very difficult. Because the chazan, when they're standing there, it's not just the big voice. I mean, we, that, that's not, that's not, doesn't come into it. It's not a concert. It's not a performance. What this is, is a, a chazan is the visionary who holds in his or her arms the souls of every single person in that community with all their different yearnings, joys, anxieties, pain, everything, and has to be totally aware of this holding of people because that's what it's about so you know, the job of the chazan is to help our people become whole i remember this uh, wonderful story i guess it was the dash the Baal Shem Tov, and he came into a little shtetl and uh, Cantor did his best to sing his soul out and came afterwards to the best Revenue, how did you like my voice? And the answer was wrong question. The question should be, did God hear the prayer of the people? And here we are coming to the next question and that is very difficult to explain in words. How do we teach people. So I see Keva and Kavanal a little bit like the, the story of the black fire and the white fire. They, they say that before the world was created, Torah was uh, already, so the letters were already there and they were black fire on white fire. And if you look in the Torah, there are spaces in between the letters. Yeah, And I was taught by my teachers that the real Torah is in between the letters. So the letters are the keva, and in between the letters is the story of all our people, all those who came before us and were reading Torah. So how do we find this? How do we enable our students to find their inner place from where they are able to daven, because is the, if the chazan doesn't daven, the community, how can the community daven? Yeah? Unless you have very strong and experienced daveners there, but how you are doing it. And I think that's a very big challenge of our work. And that's why um, we don't teach our students not only one-to-one -one at the computer, but mm. we also teach them uh, in a community. So how to create a kahal, how to create when you have a retreat within three days, a kehila kedosha, and it is possible. So uh, this personal um, experience, this life experience is so important. Jackie, do you want to say a little bit more about our life coaching we are doing oh gosh i always said that uh, prayer i don't like the word prayer it's to feel uh, much better it's far a far more jewish concept of uh, of, of the internal uh, examination that yearning uh, is leading to uh that prayer is is not taught it's caught it's caught because what happens is the experience and the and the experience of the shliach tibor or the chazan or the baltfila, whatever you call them, 
if that is like my my go, my first reference to Martin Cooper when he stood there as a 21 year old fellow, I caught that. He didn't teach me anything, although he taught me the world. I caught it because what I caught was the soul and I caught the sincerity of his being. And I would say that uh, I caught my teachers as well, their soul and uh, what they were doing. I, I read that. Of course I needed the... The, you know, the, the, what I call the academic knowledge. I mean, I was passionate about learning the intricacies of Nusach HaTfilah and, you know, sort of all the musical and, you know, everything with it. Very important to teach. But it goes far, far beyond that. We have to look all the time to its purpose, the purpose, and how do we teach that? I think the way I learned it was to catch it. I don't know about you, Yelda, because you learned also from wonderful cousin Jack Kessler. What a yeah. wonderful teacher, and he's helped us so much. So, you know, you can talk about that. So um, I uh, went into a role model what all the seminaries should do, and we call it the Davenin Leadership Training Institute. I was one of the first who were blessed to get this wonderful program uh, created by um, Rabbi Marsha Prager, uh, Rabbi Sean Zevit, and our wonderful cousin Jack. And when we started our retreats, um, we invited cousin Jack and uh, Rabbi Marsha Prager uh, to our retreats and it was a learning by doing for all of us because Europe is very different from the United States for many reasons that would be a story of a totally different talk I don't want to go there right now but we invited also other teachers we invited Joey Weisenberg the before he became so famous as he is now, today we would not be able to pay him. And uh, <laughs> we invited uh, somebody who is very deep in meditation, uh, Rabbi James Jacob Meisels. So we learned learning by doing with many different teachers and our students who are coming in, some of them are coming back and back and back are getting from every teacher a little bit. Mm. So that's another stick in the eagle education. We encourage our students, please learn from more than only one teacher. Mm. Find your teacher. So sometimes students are switching teachers and we are teachers are very happy with that because all of us have a very special strength what others don't have. And uh, the next question, ah, yeah, and the, the, so the, the, the moment, what is our task? It's the music of our tefillah, mm -hmm. what holds both, ah. heaven and kavana. So yes. the music gives us the time frame, yeah, whether it is uh, Chol or Shabbat or uh, Chagim or whatever. Um, but it it needs also the kavana. So if you are going to do what I where I mostly start with students, so there is a difference between ma'arif chol and shacharit chol, and the day might be a different one. Is it a rainy day, dark day, or is it a joyful day, a spring day, with whatever? So go to figure out what is the, 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 the flavor, the air. When you are coming into a shul, yeah, you, first you say hello to everybody and you see the, the kids and say, oh, they grew so much and you are listening. So your first job as a cousin is to listen to those in your kahal and to feel where they are. And when you know how all these people feel, 
And when you catch it, then you can go up to the bima uh, or sit in the circle or wherever and start to collect the sparks that the tila can go up to the source of life. Yes, and you know that's just reminded me of something, Yelda. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of memory mm. um, because we Jews have got a collective memory like no other. And we're looking at this now with tomorrow's event and the, you know, everything that the Jewish people have been through. Not that other people haven't as well, but we're talking about our people at the moment. So I want to suggest, and I, my guess is that everybody, I have no idea how many people we've got on, but everybody who is listening to this will remember back to moments from their childhood um, that have been significant to them, whether good in good things or in bad things. And it will be mainly about how it left them feeling, not what it made them think, but how it made them feel, how it made them feel. And we have, as Jews, this collective memory. And I really believe that our, our tefillah is based on this. And it's uh, without any zahor. I mean, you know, it's so important to us. But in terms of Nusach, and I can only speak about the, um, uh, the, the Ashkenazi Eastern European mo methods that we, you know, some West as well, because they mingled. But, mm -hmm. you know... Um, it's the Jewish experience. It's the what you brought in at the beginning, that wonderful um, uh, folk piece of the uh, uh, your mother of blessed memory that she sang. Fred developed the Alta Kasha. You know, what is that Alta Kasha? We don't know the answer. So what do we do? We sing another Nigan because that gives us the answer. The answer comes in the Nigan. It's in the melody. So the, the melodies come as collective memory. And so when we are davening um, an evening whole, you know, weekday evening, uh, in our tradition, you know, it's in a fragish. It's in the, it's in the Ahava Rabba mode, uh, mainly. And, um, but the way we do that in the evening, you wouldn't do it the same as you do the Fregish in Shacharit. Why? Because that's morning where it's bright and we're waking up. Here, this is where, oh, you know, we've had a tough day. It's the end. I'm looking out of my window here in England where it's now a uh, quarter to six and it's pitch black out there and it's raining. My mood is going to be very, very different, Devening Mariv, from uh, a daytime in the bright light but and the Nusach it, I remember I distinctly in my ear as well my teacher Hazan Solzim saying when we're doing Mariv Fahol it's always like the lower end of the of, of the Nusach it's the lower end of the Fregish of the scale it's a, keep it to the lower end and over the time I began to realize why that was you see, there's a reason for everything. And this mode designates the mood to a point, but you are the one who's creating the, we have to create the environment and the atmosphere. And that's the job of the Chazam, the Shliach Tibor. That's our job. Jackie, we are living in very difficult times. Um, I remember at uh, our last retreat, we were discussing how do we moving on in challenging times. And uh, this quote from uh, Psalm 9039 came to me. Uh, um, uh, lo yachshich so even the darkness is not dark for you. Uh, as your darkness is your light. 
So, and we still didn't know what was waiting for us. So how do we help our community and ourselves to find the light in the darkness? What are the challenges of our new life? And I want to touch here, very difficult issue, the issue of online minyanim. Yeah. <laughs> It's a very difficult issue, isn't it, Yalda? Because uh, there are many online uh, uh, services going on around the world, and kolakavod to them. Uh, there are many ways of approaching this. Um, our shul actually doesn't have them on Shabbat uh, because we don't use, uh, you know, it's a halachic movement. We don't use the electricity, and uh, and we only we we don't even have our own building, so we can't you know, do that. But there are shuls that do. And when people say to me, oh, you know, you, we must have, so I can always direct them to some site if that's what they want. My own personal thing is that I can't do it. And, and that's a very personal thing. And I share it now uh, because there may be other people who feel this way as well. And it's a feeling. And it is this. Um, to me, uh, davening, even when I'm uh, davening as a shliach sibor and not on my own, uh, it's a very personal uh, experience. I am already in my particular mode of space or whatever. And uh, I find that when I'm watching somebody daven, I, I, it's very uncomfortable for me because it's like voyeurism. It's a horrible thing to say. It's the feeling I get. I don't want somebody to watch me when I'm deafening and I don't want to watch somebody else either. But this is a very, very personal thing. I did do Kol Nidre. Uh, we, did the, uh, we did it obviously before it came in. And uh, somebody recorded it and put it out on Facebook, so I watched it, and I felt ill. I couldn't, I couldn't watch myself. So I don't like watching people davening. It's, it, to me, it's uh, an invasion. It, 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 it's painful. So therefore, I don't, eat, I don't go online davening. I daven myself. And it's also painful because I need my people. And I haven't got my people with me. So, but I so respect those people who need and who find solace in, in, in davening online or finding a minion online or which, whatever, you know, they need it. I can't, I, it's very, very difficult. To, I, I, but this is, as I say, it's a very personal thing and I wouldn't want people to think that that's the way it's got to be done. Chas v'chalila, it's not right. I'm not saying to somebody how they should feel or what they should do, but you can say a different thing. Yeah, so I have, I'm, I'm sitting on a, at a different chair. Um, we are running, I guess, meanwhile, since uh, more than three years and uh, European virtual minion, uh, the idea was created by uh, Rabbi Hannah Natans from Delft and me and uh, my wonderful colleague uh, Hazan Lea Frey Rabine is managing the whole thing. So we get together the edges <laughs> or the frings, the, the, the fringes of uh, European Jews who are sitting in little places where they have no shul. And they became very thankful. So we are running this uh, European minion mostly uh, uh, after Shabbat. So Motzei Shabbos um, Ma'ariv in uh, or Mincha um, at uh, Sunday, and it what became very important for people. So the moment we we had the lockdown. So it was no problem for me immediately to go online. And I had many calls from people of our congregation. What we are going to do is that, okay, let's have Pesach 
on Zoom. So we put the computer on the table for everybody in the community. It was suddenly a challenge. So I got questions how I do the cushering and how we, we shared recipes. And so the people suddenly had to be active by themselves. Normally everything is provided if they are coming for the Seda. It became a learning process and we move on um, with these online uh, services because it brings people together. And Jackie, there is another way of davening, yeah? So for the Amida, you can step step off the, the, the camera and collect people when they are coming back. So there are different tools to do that and we are here at two different places. Um, and I think the, the most important is what is the need of the community? So that mm -hmm. was taught by my wonderful teacher, uh, Hazen Jack and, uh, and Rabbi Masha and Reb Zalman. They always said, look where your community is. Mm -hmm. If you have a picture of your community and you start there, you will lose them. So you have to take the people where they are and then start to try to develop, to develop a special culture. And there, Jackie, you mm -hmm. are a master, really. So I really chapeau uh, for your wonderful Kahal. We have had um, three Schlichei Zibur who got a, a Baal Twila diploma and two came from your shul. The other one was uh, uh, Sarah Lee Sherelle Fox in Jerusalem. So this is a blessing. Somebody is going, even though he has a totally different uh, uh, job, he's going to learn the entire Matbeya Tvila, mm -hmm. all the Chagim, all the six uh, versions uh, to, to read um, uh, our Tenach. So it's, it's such a the work they do, it is amazing. So call her Kavot, Jackie, and- um, And you. you had, uh, mm, uh, <laughs> with my Kahila, I'm not so successful as you are, because very often when it starts to become uh, difficult, uh, it's, it's hard to, um, uh, let us say, to, to empower people not to give up. Uh, that's uh, that's the hardest piece uh, in it. But um, you brought a little recording uh, talking about Keva and Kavana of oh. two people of uh, your shul called Nefesh. Um, what is not a professional recording, it is just a uh, telephone what was there. And uh, we can feel in this recording where we are talking about. Yes, um, I'm going to bring this, and this is the end, really, of our, uh, of our conversation at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to bring this because uh, two of my wonderful, wonderful uh, guys who were learning and, and uh, taking part in leading one year the uh, uh, Col Nidre service. So uh, one of them, found a recording on, uh, on YouTube by uh, the Miami Boys Choir. And the, it was Yalev uh, Yavo, which is for Rosh Chodesh, it's for Chagim. Uh, uh, anyway, we have a beautiful piyut, uh, uh, a poem, if you like, which is the start of the Selichot section after the Amidah uh, for each of the five services on uh, uh, Yom Kippur. And on the Kol Nidre, so on the Erev Yom Kippur, this beautiful piyot is called Ya'ale Tachanuneinu Me Erev, Yavo, whatever, Me Boker, Yerae, whatever, Ad Arev. So it has a, a pattern to it and it's in the form of a reverse acrostic. So it's, it's instead of going Aleph Bet Gimel Dalet, it goes Tafshin Reish Kruf downwards, right? So that's the structure of it. Nobody knows who who composed this beautiful poem, but Yaale uh, Yaale Tachanu Neinu. So these two boys, Ilan and Simon, decided to play with it, 
and uh, took Ilan had taken this melody and he started to craft uh, with Simon and this is a totally spontaneous thing and Ilan went to the piano Simon was standing next to him and I thought I'd better put my phone on record just you know want to like, goodness knows where it was going to take us and this for Erev Yom Kippur at the beginning of the Selichot section is the Ya'ale Tachanunim. So Laurie, if you can play it, please. <laughs> Yeah. 
what a deep emuna is in this text, in this very old piyut, what a deep emuna we find in this beautiful melody. And that's what makes us strong as a, as a people, as Jews, what we are. And it's our kishkes, it's in our tradition, it's in our Torah, and uh, our music is Torah. It's also Torah, is a part of the Torah. And that's what we have to keep and to hold on, even we are in difficult times right now, and what will keep us alive. Im Yotzeh Hashem, for ge many generations more, made eagle fly. Oh, so, thank you. There have been many questions. So, Geraldine, I hope you have collected them. <clears throat> well, what an what a inspiring and beautiful presentation from both of you. Really wonderful to listen to you. Um, there were people who were saying, where can they hear this again, Jackie? Is it on your phone? Or <laughs> I've said, well, they can certainly hear it again on the on the recording of this presentation. <laughs> uh, Nicole Nefesh has actually um, got it on the website under the High Holy Days uh, stuff. Okay, so maybe so perhaps uh, you can send the link. I, yeah. could, I mean, if somebody would make it nice from my phone, that would be lovely. I don't know uh, <laughs> if able to do that. Uh, Jackie, ask James and he will create a link and then we can link, send out the link to the website. That's what we'll do. Yeah. yeah, and Laurie can probably help too because he's got it now. So there you are. But that was lovely. Um, Steve Robbins, you wanted to say something. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Un unmute, unmute. Yes, okay, I'm muted. Okay, Jackie and Yada, what a lovely presentation. <laughs> I must say, Jackie, you're looking very, very, very nice. <laughs> lovely, lovely. <laughs> okay, uh, great to see you and, and to listen to you. Um, yeah, Nusach is always a problem, especially nowadays in London. They only seem to want to have Kolbach on a Friday night and it's beginning to grate. It's just, that's the only thing they know. You are someone that hasn't stood up there and done before, the first thing they do is they, they go straight into Karlebach. And, but, you know, some of them better than others, but by and large, it grates. And I'm hoping at some point it will eventually go off the radar. I don't know how we deal with this. Any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, Yalda and I were having a talk about this kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with Kalabar. I mean, you know, it depends how it's done, I suppose. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with Kalabar. I mean, people love the music and they want to sing. And if they're putting their kishkas in it, lama la, you know, just <laughs> let that, they'll do it. But Yalda yeah. and I were talking about yesterday's keva becoming tomorrow's kavana. Mm. Um, it's a funny way of putting it, but yesterday's... Um, or today's things that are uh, like sacred, like the Kalabach, tomorrow will be taken over by something else. Yes. Is, will, will the Nusach survive? Yes, um, indeed. And, uh, uh, you know, we don't know. We can only do our best to... Of um, course. Uh, yes, but from my own perspective, just moving on perhaps to Shabbat morning, you know, congregants come in, they've had a hard week, they're coming Shabbat morning, and they just catch most likely want to sing along. And um, the, the Shechis Yiburim that I've been teaching, I always do the same thing. We do the Enkemocha, and then I ask them to sing it, and they give some sort of response. And I said, but you're just singing notes. I said, how about looking at the English text and sing it in English? Sing it yeah. in English. Sing it in English. Enkema, who is like you? And who could be composed for you? I said, now just having said that in English, Think it the same way in, in its villa. It works um, absolute magic. So my advice to both of you, as you're asking, well, you're probably very seasoned teachers, and Jackie, you've heard that from me a few times too, I think, that um, make them sing the tefila in English if they're not sure. And it will take on a completely new magic touch. It's that magic pace of your mind singing the words so that you know what you're singing. And yes. that, will, that will uplift, uplift the dabbling. 
some of them say, well, you don't, you don't do like that on the Shabbos morning. I said, yes, I think you're just not listening. You're just too tired and busy talking to your neighbour. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, there it is. I, I want to, uh, Steve, you're absolutely right. I do use this uh, a lot because, uh, yeah. you know, it, 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 obviously it, it makes people sit up, start, oh, is that what I'm singing? You know, yeah. um, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> I want to commend my lovely elder here because she is actually presenting this in her fourth language. So when we talk about singing it in English, uh, you know, Yalda can do this in Dutch, German, Yiddish, uh, and Hebrew, and whatever everything else. Yeah. Well, so here, to be to... honest, uh, sorry, I have to interrupt at this moment. It was part of my education. So please sing it in your in the language you are using the most. And That's then right. I tried to daven in German and I was not able to. So mm -hmm. I was able to go into Dutch. I was able to go into Yiddish, English. It's fine. But uh, for me, davening in German is impossible. So there I have a thing in my <laughs> head and it might be in two generations uh, Jews are perhaps already this generation what is now growing up will have no problem with that but that's an an, an issue but another way of teaching is uh, um, what I'm often doing sitting then with people and translating and for example Hama'ariv Aravim the beauty of Hebrew and and how what what the music is hama arif arabim so to take it as a love song or um as as uh, jake loves to say uh, it's an uh, like like singing a, a love song and romance to somebody yes. and this very often so if you are getting your students to get the piece of love into our tefillah then you got already a lot i absolutely I, I, I uh, what I'm starting to suggest now to some of my, some of my students that they're doing Friday night, but to, to look at um, Yadid Navesh, such a love song. Yes, yeah, so that it drips like honey. And I said, look how sweet that is. You know, think about the romance of it, you know? And, and the whole of Friday night is, is, is talking about come the bride, you know, the bride of Shabbat. You know, think of a beautiful bride in your mind when you're singing this. It, you'll find how difference your voice will sound and how much you will engage with people so all these sort of tips are very very useful you know so mm. that's my, my two pedals there <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, okay. who else would like to uh, to say something um, make a comment or a question um, Jack, Jack Kessler would you like to unmute? I suppose I could. Yes, thank you very much. Kala uh, kavod to uh, to Jackie and Yalda, and also for the uh, the astute things that have been said. Uh, just to backtrack a tiny bit, and the uh, about the significance of Musach relative to all of the folk melodies, um, as we are all quite aware. Um, there's a lot of folk melodies that are standard, I don't want to say traditional because I'm tired of the word, um, that are standard usage um, all over the place in, uh, in Jewish communities, whether they be Ashkenazi or Mizrahi. And um, the, uh, these folk melodies are not necessarily going to be in Nusach scales. Uh, and it's the reality. We've been doing it for over a thousand years. And the best way I can see to moving forward is to teach um, service musical practice as a combination of the two, that's Nusach and, and folk melodies, um, with the primary emphasis being um, that Nusach is the core context in which folk melodies throughout which can be inserted. It's not like it's one thing or another. Uh, I have actually one of my current uh, students in the Aleph Cantorial program uh, is a very talented gal. She's working in a big reform shul in South Florida, one of these places with three, count them, three rabbis. 
And uh, what she has been doing, and, and this is the Re American reform culture of nonstop folk melody with you know the, the guitar and the band and whatever, and whoever the composer may be. Um, uh, but she has been working out a format um, with uh, alternating folk melody with Nusach material, solo Chazan material, so that uh, that she can gradually educate the congregation to what at least I see as the larger context of how to do it in shul. And if she can do it in uh, the extremes of American reform, then I think there's hope. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Uh, in this point, uh, beloved uh, teacher, Hazen Jack, um, I want uh, to point to your English Megillah uh, Idril right now is running a course uh, on uh, cantillation of Megillat Esther in two tracks. One track is the uh, Ashkenazi one taught by Hasan Dex Blumenfeld and the Sephardi one is the, taught by um, Osnat uh, Benusan from Jerusalem from Dekel Yehuda, Kehilat Dekel Yehuda. And uh, the challenge for many people is the Hebrew, <laughs> because reading Megillat Esther can be boring. So I strongly want to recommend here Chazen Jack's English version, because you can play with both. Yeah, You can repeat a shtickle in English so that people are getting uh, really the fun of the, of the reading of Megillat Esther. So yeah, I'd like to second that, Yalda, because uh, Jack, I've used your English version of the Megillah as in between each rendering. It makes it a bit long, but it doesn't matter because it's still fun. Um, so, so we read the, we lay in the whole thing, of course. And uh, before each chapter, I do your English version. And it is such fun. People love it. So thank you for that. I would recommend it. I think anybody who wants it can probably find me somewhere online um, or through through Aleph, and I'll be happy to share it. I've been I've been giving all of this material away, so please. Okay, if you you know anything you want, if you email it to me, I will put it into the report so that when you read the report of the session, you'll see all the links that you can go to for various things. Um, anybody else like to say something, wave your hand or do something so I can notice you or just unmute and shout, Rachel, Rachel. Hi there, this, this is wonderful. And I'm gonna ask a question right now. My landlady is running around and may need me in a few seconds, but um, I'm going to ask now while she's downstairs. Um, I, I've, I've sort of followed Egil for a while and sort of the way I, I'm sort of known the way that Egil connects with individual service leaders who want to learn more about how to lead their individual congregations. What I'm wondering is um, sort of how are, how is this connecting with communities thing developing? What, what sort of, what sort of methods have you been using to reach entire communities? Yalda, do you want to go first? Yeah, so I, I want to tell the, the, the story of a student of ours from Moscow. She approached us, uh, a beautiful singer, beautiful voice, Yiddish singer, and uh, they started uh, a Marom group, and but they wanted also she wanted also to to include all her friends, and they started with Kabbalat Shabbat. So I started to, to teach her shtikalich from, from Kabbalah Shabbat and we started with some songs because in my head was this lady wants to create a meaningful Kabbalah Shabbat for her little group. And uh, so the way the, the pieces I taught to, to her, she immediately brought to her little group. And so she started to develop uh, Kehila with... Uh, um, yeah, with what she was uh, learning. So this is one of the many stories uh, we can share at this point. Yeah, we have lots of students who uh, um, we've taught and, and they, just as Yalda said, 
go back into their community and teach little by little, little by little. And, mm -hmm. you know, look, whatever you, whatever people do, you know, it's not an academic exercise. You do it with love. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You love the people. You love the Nusach and the, and the Tefillah. And slowly, slowly, you know, some kind of magic will happen, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've had a lot of uh, a lot of success around Europe and uh, other places, not just Europe, not just Europe. So, Thank you. Um, that's it. yeah, or what we also did, we had a retreat in 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 Paris uh, for the small Masorti community there. There we had also Hasan Jack and uh, and and Marsha. And it was really a gewaltig uh, day in Paris. And uh, so it is, it is not only what you teach, but it is the question how you teach. And as long if I'm able to bring over the love I have for the liturgy and all its differences and all its different possibility, if I'm able to bring the love to our students, and if I tell the students, this is one way, there is no right and wrong in our tradition. We are different. Or as Jackie always says, it says it is appropriate, not appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so J Jackie always tells uh, uh, the story how you come into shul and you get the Kol Nidre on the Maus Zuid melody. So no, <laughs> that's the point where everybody says immediately, oh no, yeah. Um, but it is always the question, how are the balance of Keva and Kavana? Thank you so oh, much. Oh, I saw a good question. What's this? Yes. If we offer a uh, cantorial ordination, Jackie, Oh, right. <laughs> now, here comes out, this is the news, really, because the answer to that is yes, but it's new. Um, we have we have a program called the Baltifilla Diploma Program, which the syllabus for that is learning the complete Matbea Tefila, complete, every Nusach for every day of the year, if you like plus all the cantillations, plus the life cycle events. And everything. So you know what you're doing. And um, that's the bald filler. But the chazan goes further. The chazan is um, a person who ministers to community. And, uh, and so therefore we've added a rabbinic side to it and also uh, a pastoral side to it so that uh, people have to do you know, pastoral care and uh, anything that a minister ministers to a community, really. And, and so we have been asked to do this. It's a bit scary for us because um, in the big picture, we're quite new and we're different because we're an academy without walls. We have no place. We have just us and the people and our teachers, our beloved team, who Yalda is uh, looking after so beautifully now. And... Um, and, and so, yes, the answer is yes. And each person who wants a uh, Hazan uh, Samicha, because both of us got it, by the way. Some cantorial schools don't do that. They give uh, a, a, what they call an investiture or something that's not quite as good as a rabbi. Well, you know, we're clergy too. And... Um, so uh, we, we were both ordained in our schools, uh, Yalda with Chazan Jack in Aleph, and I with uh, Solzim, Chazan Solzim, and of course, the, you know, it's a rabbinical school and a cantorial school that work together. And so we both got ordained, and we see no reason now that we have been asked to do this. And people have come to us and asked us to do this. So how can, who, how, how can we possibly say, no, we won't? Yes, we will. Excellent, excellent. 
Anybody? So here I, sorry, here I really want to add what cousin Jackie always is uh, saying. So when I was in the in the Aleph um, Cantorial program, it was pretty early. We were only a few people, and we studied together with the rabbis the entire time. And I always say we studied as long as the rabbis did. Only our focus was a different one. Uh, just to to take people have always the picture of the, 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 the Christian church where the priest is doing everything and the cantor takes care for the choir and the music in between. Yeah. But what our work is to take care for the entire Tfila and the entire Madbea Tfila. That's another task. That's another dimension of the Chazan. So that's why uh, Jackie and me agreed on we are Chazoni. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, Agnes, you wanted to ask a question. Um, <laughs> Agnes, you're muted. Are you going to unmute and ask your question, Agnes? Oh, no. she's, is it <laughs> Agnes, Agnes's question is, how does the minion work with a lady chazan? Ah. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful question. It, it, it works if you're in a community that counts women in a minion. End of story. If you're in a community that doesn't count women in a minion, then you've got a problem. <laughs> simple. <laughs> simple as that. <laughs> yeah, but here are we coming to the, 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 the issue of the Kol Isha. So we have uh, these uh, female rabbis who are ordained by Rabbi Weiss in the Orthodox world, and uh, they all got a job, but they are the rabbi in the sense of teacher and, and uh, Diane. Uh, but the, the issue of Kol Isha is still a discussion we have in this world. And... Uh, so for me, many years back, it was very embarrassing that I was not able to say Kaddish uh, because I'm a woman. And uh, in other places, it became really um, an important piece in my life uh, to give women the opportunity to be equal in a minion as an ad, as a witness, um, and I think it's an important uh, path uh, we have to go or we are going in our modern world. Um, yeah, so, so saying that, I want to talk more about that because uh, just uh, our wonderful student, Moria Ferros, came to me from Barcelona, who is doing wonderful, really wonderful, wonderful work. And uh, that's also a big part in her life. And we do our best to support her as good as we can. Jackie, did you want to? Well, just to say that the world is changing now. Uh, we are about to witness the first two women in the Orthodox world in England who are taking on a rabbinic program. Uh, and it is wonderful. I, I, I feel very moved by it, but you know, look, Life is like this. The reform do it first, then the conservatives do it, and then the orthodox do it, and each one think it's their idea. Uh, not to mention the Lubavitch. Well, <laughs> I'm not mentioning the Lubavitch. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter. We're all Jews, and we all do, like Yalda yeah. always says, you do things in a different way. Absolutely. <laughs> and they do things first, too. Um, more questions or comments or uh, Marsha Dubrow. Well, I'm, first of all, thank you both for this um, very um, enlightening and energetic uh, dialogue. I really have enjoyed it immensely. And, uh, you know, you raised a lot of questions that pertain to how to bring in the new or how to preserve the Nusach. And I have found just 
by way of experience that it's very difficult to be in a community that's established, to go come into a community that's established and to utilize something as beautiful and meaningful and moving as the Ya'ala that you presented. When the congregation is used to and enjoys participating in not a Karl Bach style tune or something, you know, that's very um, au courant, say, even more so than Karl Bach, but that is, you know, of something of the past that they really enjoy and love. And that is in keeping with the uh, appropriate High Holy Day Nusach, et cetera, as we come to know it in, in uh, Ashkenazic uh, uh, American uh, Nusach. So how do you reconcile those two things? I mean, you know, I, I've been thinking about this over the course of the dialogue and I, it comes to my mind that, well, you know, what can you do other than trying to educate? That theme has been, you know, very prominent in the entire uh, conversation today. So you try to educate, but there's something about an attachment, a level of attachment. You know, you talk, spoke a lot about Keva and Kavana. And for a lot of the congregants, their Kavana is wrapped up in the, the associations, the memories, not only of the years that they've been with this congregation, but maybe even their childhood years. So how do you reconcile that? How, what are your approaches to something like that? Well, Yalda, shall I go first? Or yeah, please. You go first? Yeah, please. First of all, it, you don't take away those melodies that the congregation loves, do you? You wouldn't do that. It's It's... You know, that would be, they they shoot you. You know, it's like the sign on the back of, what was it, on Casablanca, don't shoot the pianist, you know. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't do that, you know. You wouldn't deprive them of it. Um, there are times and places, and I think we have to be very sensitive to it. Uh, we can teach, and that's one thing we can do. If, you're con if it's a large congregation, you can't go changing a, a tune that, you know, if they know their ya'ale, give them their ya'ale, you know, but then you can run um, uh, little groups of people who want to learn new tunes to just bring these things in. And if you're able to um, have overflow type services or different services, you can always try them out there, but it, it's very difficult. And um, there are some beloved mem melodies. Col Nidre is the example that Yalda brought. You know, you wouldn't dream of changing that. That, how could you do that? Although no that's Col Nidre. class of its own. So that's a whole other conversation. Well, it really it, is a class yeah, of its own. Yeah, it is to a point, but, but there are, you know, there are, you know, if, if you do a different Shema Col it might be in the same mode. Right. But it, a different one from the community waiting for it. They're waiting for it. They're mm -hmm. halishing for it. You wouldn't change that. Why? You know, you're taking away the neshama from the... You wouldn't do that. So it's very difficult. And if you're in a tiny congregation, it's hard. But we did it because we were able to in the context of who we are. So when uh, Simon and Dilan did that Ya'ale, they did it in, in an antiphonal way. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, you know, he's saying Ya'ale, and the congregation goes Ya'ale, you know, it, it, it engages them. And if mm -hmm. people are engaged in the singing, then they'll love it. Even if they don't want to do it next time, they'll still have an experience that will bring a moment to them where something happened. That's Thing. Yeah. I was just curious about your how you approach that particular issue, if you have that issue in your context, because it sounds as if you're working with uh, a groups of newbies. So you have a blank slate from which to uh, inform and educate. Oh, no, not at all. They're not newbies at all. These are people who are 
completely immersed and for, you know, generations in their music. But, okay. you know, it, it, it's much deeper than that somehow. There is a, there is a, an atmosphere. There is, um, it's like Yalda said at the beginning, it's the Alta Kasha. And how do you answer the Alta Kasha with a niggin? Go on, Yalda. Um, it was oh. one of my first questions to Hazen Jack. I guess it was in 2002, so the entire emailing was new. And I got to know Hazen Jack via a recording from old tapes. And I fell immediately in love with this man because he was so careful with the words, with the text. So I suddenly could feel the poetry of our wonderful liturgy. And what that was one of my first questions. We have such a mishmash of styles in our, um, in, our, uh, in our music. So what to do with that? And his answer was, okay, and it was in the old days of the synagogue Oranienburger Straße when we all were experimenting there like crazy. And uh, his answer was, uh, um, uh, you see, we are coming from very different ways, very different paths into this one place. In the old days, um, and now I'm quoting Hazen Jack, I don't know if he's still here. He told us a story of the shul of his, his father, an old uh, uh, Southeast Hungarian shul in a city called Börje Ufalu. I can speak it out because I was once there. And, um, and people grew up in this shul and they lived their entire life in this shul for more than 500 years. It was the style of the shul. Will not say that there was no change in it. But the change went smoothly. Nowadays, you are born in London, then you go to study in LA, and then you go to work in Sydney and whatever. So we are traveling around. How can we, how can we get together all these different pieces with what we are coming? And that's a huge challenge. So one is what Hazen Jack told of one of his students who is putting together the traditional or the songs what are loved in the community with pieces of, uh, of, of, of Nusach. Another way is what he taught me in those days was mm, if you are offering, let us say once a month, a new melody, just let it try and always start with the nigan. Teach people first the nigan, first the melody, that they get the, the new music into their kishkes, into their kishkes, that they get to feel the melody. And then look what you can, how, how different you can play with the text. So that's another option. A third option is to, to uh, call together some people in your shul who want to, uh, to introduce something new. And when you are introducing something new, there are already some people in your kahal who know it, yeah? So there are, you need a lot of creativity and it takes time. And uh, so in my experience, um, I had twice experiences that I was too fast. <laughs> And the uh, result was that I was kicked off because I wanted to, to, to change too fast. So the one story um, goes to a city where I was uh, teaching a minion while I was flying back and forth uh, to the US. So what I learned, I brought immediately to this minion. And they meanwhile knew a lot. They knew the entire uh, Kabbalat Shabbat group of 10, 15 people. It was wonderful. And uh, then they wanted to bring what they had learned into the bigger shul, what was a reform shul. And they were embarrassed. <laughs> so we hadn't prepared it properly. <laughs> and that was my fault. So um, it is very hard to, to get changes into our shuls and be careful with it and uh, love the shul where it is and go with what is there. 
um, I would exactly say, you know, you're lucky if you've got a shul that loves a melody and goes with it, you know, that's blessed and, and go with it. And any new thing I would think needs to come organically. It needs to come because there's this feeling in the air that people want to sing this this tune and you they've heard this nigun, etc. So don't see it as a problem, Marsha. It's a blessing. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, you know, on the subject on the subject of start with the nigun, um, I had composed a nigun. And I ended up using it with my uh, congregation uh, that um, they loved. And we, it became sort of almost like the emblem. They took ownership of that nigan as their nigan for their congregation, you know, for our congregation. It was, it was really something we started every Kabbalah Shabbat service with that nigan so yeah i think nigans unto themselves you know that's a whole other subject but i think as a tool it can be you know they can be fabulous in terms of galvanizing a community because people don't have to know hebrew uh you don't have to resort to english and you can still invoke the um the spirit that would bespeak a collective kavana so yeah, I agree with you about that for sure. Thank you very much. And, and may I add something to that? And the Negan can be the, 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 like, like a coat over the entire thing. So I remember also it was in the, I guess 2001 or something like that. So we created our uh, own um, um, uh, Rosh Hashanah uh, liturgy as the learning minion. And uh, so the children were involved. We created our own Mahsa with the, with the pictures of the children. It was fantastic because it was a group of learning people who knew a little shtickle from here and a little shtickle from there. And uh, so what I decided, I decided for a Negan. So when we had a moment that somebody somehow was lost of this group, we immediately picked up the Negan to hold the energy in the room. Yeah, so th that was no problem. If somebody was lost for what reason ever, uh, you was able with the Negan to hold the entire atmosphere. So for, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for um, the high Hondi Yamim Noraim, it's uh, for example the, the, the beautiful Nigan I learned from uh, um, from Reb Zalman Shachta Shalom Yedes. Hashem Ori Ori Veishi Ori Veishi Mimira. So every time I have somehow to collect the people for the. High holidays who are talking and I want them back to the to 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 Tvila, I start with this nigan and then they sing along and because after 25 hours uh, they slowly know this nigan and then you get the get them back into the, the place where you want to have them. Can I just add something to that? Yalda, you said something very important, and that was about energy. It's about spiritual energy and spiritual energy. I don't mean, you know, big energy like kids use, but you've got to use the, uh, the rhythm and the energy you get that. I'm talking about spiritual energy, which can be very soft and very slow. And, uh, and I've watched Joey Weisenberg We've been with him a lot, actually. We've had him here in England uh, a few times, and he came to Israel to the yeshiva as well. When he teaches a nigan, he can take half an hour on one little melody, and he says, you learn it properly. You know, don't harmonize with it, because it's very easy to harmonize for somebody with a musical ear. You all, all automatically, I do anyway. I already harmonize, but he teaches and you, you just spend that time. It takes time and we have to have patience and it's hard, but it works eventually. And it's about the creation of that energy 
that beautiful spiritual energy. And there are moments when it happens. It's about moments, I think. You know, we've got to be, you know, Geraldine says you're lucky to have a community that wants to sing. That's true. But you can, you can, you can create that. Well, I just I admire the work you're doing um, in, in a context about which I, I really know nothing, namely what's happening on the, the continent and in the UK. So it seems as if you've, you're really creating something very important and uh, presumably something that will endure. So I wish you great mazel with your journey. Thank you. I wonder, Isaac, are you there? You just put your picture on. You have a very young person. I'd love to have a comment from you and to hear <laughs> you've made of all this because uh, it would be really nice to hear from you. Um, I feel slightly put on the spot. I don't suppose you have a, a, a sort of, I don't know, more specific question or... or... Well, just to comment, how have you found this presentation? And where do you come into this picture? How do you, are you a, training to be a cantor? Do you sing? Um, I have I, your Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, yes, con, con, conspicuous by my age. I didn't intend to be. Um, I, so I, 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 I've known Jackie for a few years now through um, the Sooty movement, and and I'm involved in in Egil. And I um, and uh, so I'm also working with with, with the elder in each other and wanted to hear, hear them both. It's how I found it. And um, I yes, I thought it's been. I think it's been an extremely extremely interesting couple of hours. Um, it's always um, wonderful to hear you both talk and hear your stories and your, your thoughts and things. Um, the uh, and um, all the sort of things you said about about community and and Kavanaugh, uh, uh, yeah, really important and, and and valuing. I don't know if you've put on the spot. Um, I think it's, a, it's just a lot about valuing um, the the melody sort of present in the community, the oral like memory of melodies. So the things that we were saying. Uh, in 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 this discussion just now about about like beloved melodies and the things we were saying much earlier about Nusach, it, it's like the whole thing is sort of a uh, like this this art of like creating and then using and then creating and then using these associations. Like when we use a Nusach, we like implant a memory of it, and then the next and then we use the memory of it the next time, and we do that as people grow up and as they live in it and as they get old, and it's it's just that creating associations and then using those associations that's that's what i guess i feel like you've been speaking to and to answer other question no i'm i'm am i training to be a cantor not really i'm 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 studying um i'm studying ethnomusicology i i, I grew up in in the Sephardi community in uk and i am learning the nusach there but i'm not i'm not currently looking into any sort of ordination what's it so like formal yes but um not really Isaac is part of our wonderful, really wonderful, wonderful magic eagle online team, and he is one of those who does make makes these magic thing, things happen. That the the what we are planning to do is going into the world, and I don't understand what he is doing, but it is fantastic. So I'm very thankful that we have Isaac in the team. Oh. Isaac is a blessing, and I want to say uh, just one little reason why, because there are many. And Isaac, I know it's, it's hard, we put him on the spot. Isaac created the first egalitarian Sephardi minion in England, which is running, I think they use the Jewish Vegetarian Society when they're able to meet. And he is a wonderful young man who is a very serious musicologist. He's now doing his master's at SOAS. And um, uh, he comes from a rabbinic background and um, uh, he, it was his influence, I have to tell you, that uh, made us really sit up and think about Egil's work in, 
in having uh, Sephardic as well as Ashkenazic um, expressions of Nusach HaTefila within our, our ongoing programs. And he is now very involved in it. And I say, I am so, so happy and so grateful for that. So uh, Isaac, you hide your light under a bushel, but I'm shining it for you. Well, thank you, Jackie, and thank you, Isaac, because it's really important. Sorry to put you on the spot, but you were great. I mean, it's really important for us to know that there are people like you who are taking this and carrying it on and, and circulating it, which, which is important. And you're most welcome to this forum, which is a forum for scholars, practitioners, librarians, and everybody. So I think that's a, a beautiful moment to... To, to end, and Alex Knapp is going to unmute and say a few words. Yes, hello. Can you Hi. hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, it's a very special privilege for me to be able to offer what we might call a vote of thanks to Jacqueline and Yelda, and I'm grateful to Geraldine for inviting me to do so, uh, because this has been a very, very special event, um, and for all sorts of reasons. First of all, because I've known Jackie for a very long time, uh, and I've known Yelda for not quite such a long time, but we've worked together, and it's been a real pleasure to be able to exchange thoughts and to be able to work in a field that we both love. Um, my, my feeling about this afternoon or evening or morning or wherever you happen to be in the world um, ha has been that it's not only been intellectually very rich, um, full of very interesting information, uh, full of obviously deep knowledge, but the thing that has come over to me most strongly perhaps is this feeling of love and devotion and sincerity that is being, are being brought to the whole uh, function of Chazonis and Chazanim uh, and the whole feeling of communication and the feeling of compassion and understanding and concern for other people and other people's feelings. And this something I think is extremely precious. And I just want to say how much I've really um, absorbed what both um, Jackie and uh, Yalda have been saying, but it comes really from a very, very deep place. It comes from, I think, beyond music, uh, beyond text. It, it comes really from some kind of spiritual realm beyond. And I feel that it has spoken to all of us. And I want to thank both of you very, very much indeed, with all my heart, for having been so open uh, and so, in a sense, vulnerable um, to be able to express these things in a, such an articulate and such a meaningful way. So I just want to say thank you very much indeed, and also for the musical examples that you brought, which were very beautiful and really um, enhanced, uh, really, the essence of what you were presenting today. So obviously, Kavana is uh, the theme, and Kavana has come across in not only what you were talking about, but how you were talking about it. So thank you very much indeed, Toraba, Todaraba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And Geraldine, thank you. Yes. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure. Charles, did you want to just say something or are you just waving to us? You're just, you're just saying hi. Charles very kindly is going to write a little summary of what you've been able to say today. So that's a real, uh, <laughs> a real well challenge. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. He's a star at doing that. So this is a wonderful forum and Jackie and Yelda, you've given a, a really wonderful presentation as part of this this getting together of scholars, practitioners, and everybody. i just tell you what we're having next week. Um, next week, we actually have the great-grandson of A.Z. Edelson. He's written a book about his great-grandfather, and he's going to be talking about it with Baruch Cohen, who studied with Edelson. So there's that wonderful connection there for next week. And the week after that, Mark Sloban with Joshua Valetsky are taking a fresh look at Yiddish folk song. And they're talking about this new uh, online Yiddish folk song project. So, you know, we really look forward to seeing you in the future. If you want to, if you haven't signed up for the Humanities Commons, our 
Jewish music group there, please try and do that because that's the easiest way that I can reach you or we, you can reach each other because what we're trying to do is to facilitate interaction and communication between all sections of Jewish music scholarship. And the humanities commons is the base plate where we all get together. So try that and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. So I'll shortly close the session, but if anybody wants to just chat, we'll stop the recording now.